definitely seen this clip in some shape or fashion. And yes, there was a whole movie that went along with it. I never knew it could be like this. 1953's From Here to Eternity truly is a film from a different time. What do you want to go back to the army for? What do I want to go back to the army for? I'm a soldier. A period where cinema was still the biggest form of entertainment, and where a romantic drama with only loose connections to a war didn't just clean up at the Oscars, but was the event movie for people to see, and with a cast combining star power and acting gold. You think I'm lying, don't you? Nobody ever lies about being lonely. For me, anyway, this is a film that demonstrates the real heights the golden age of Hollywood could reach. The setting is a US Army base in Hawaii circa 1941, chronicling the melodrama and love lives of the soldiers leading up to a certain event. The Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor. Yes, I know what you're thinking of, and I assure you that this is the film Pearl Harbor wanted to be. Sort of. From now on, it's no holds barred. They aim to run you right in the stockade if they got to. Let them. Our source is a 1952 novel by soldier-turned-writer James Jones, who based the story on his own experience witnessing the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and he indeed served in a boxing company like the one in the story. See, I used to fight middleweight, and I was pretty good. But while a handful of characters were based on real people, everything was mostly made up and it was just a really good work of fiction. Let's get it down to a system. He kicks them a lot too. The book was controversial for its depictions of prostitution, corruption in the army, and even implied sexual abuse. But of course it was still an instant success, and the film adaptation followed quickly. What you doing in uniform? I think you're joining the army. <laughs> Frank Sinatra being cast seems like a no-brainer, but at the time his career was on a bit of a downturn, and he was yet unproven as a dramatic actor. Oh, you made a very bad mistake. In the end, he was cast because he only charged $8,000. His stock was that low. But it was this dramatic turn as Angelo Maggio, soldier who ends up tortured in the stockade and dies tragically, that led to a now familiar pattern of dark dramatic role equals career revival. I done it, Prue. I escaped just like I said. Just like I figured. There's a popular urban legend that he used his mob connections to get the part, and it inspired a certain scene in The Godfather, but there's no actual proof. Nah, what I would not give to have this character in a corner pool room in my hometown. A similar myth surrounded George Reeves having his role cut down because audiences allegedly kept going, there's Superman, and the movie Hollywoodland used it, but again, no proof. Because nobody's gonna stop me from my plan. Nobody, nothing. Continuing the against type casting choices, Alma the Call Girl went to Donna Reed, who was best known as the Saintly Mary from It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, I don't like it, but I don't mind it. She wasn't the first choice, but the studio wanted her, and director Fred Zinnemann had been fighting them on several other castings, so he went, what the hell. It's a pretty story, isn't it? Maybe they could write a book about it. They did. Thousands of them. This at least had the effect that both lead actresses were cast against type. Who did he get for Karen Holmes, the depressed adulteress? The Harry Cohn said, Deborah Carr, like that. And they both looked at each other and said, my god, of course, but marvellous. That would be, uh, that's going right against the obvious. As I have said many times, one of the greatest actresses of the day. And in the day, no one would have seen her playing this role. Nobody's ever going to think of me in those terms. They just, they just aren't. I mean, my god, it would be mar marvellous. I'd adore to do it. But then he said, well, since we can have a try. But you can thank this for helping her towards the more interesting parts she wanted to play. I've never been so miserable in my life as I have since I met you. Neither have I. One actor everyone was happy with was Burt Lancaster. I wouldn't trade a minute of him. Neither would I. Despite having started as a circus performer and being best known for adventure films, he was already varying his roles long before this script came along. Life's crummy. You know what? Having served in the army before he was an actor, casting him as warden was natural. You get your whole company to take care of. You move over. Move over to the other side of the road. Ah, I'm old. It don't matter if I die. And last, but most definitely not least... We're the company boxers. I figured. Fred Zinnemann fought studio exec Harry Cohn to cast the lead of Pruitt with Montgomery Clift, who should be remembered as one of the greats. People on the outside had their eye on him. He was gonna come out of the army and go right up to the top. Seriously, half this video will be me just gushing about how good his performance is. He was in a coma for a week, and uh, finally did pull out of it. 
Only the thing was that uh, he was blind. Montgomery Clift was part of the school of method actors including Marlon Brando and James Dean, who helped bring a new kind of vulnerability to the typical leading man roles. Well, I went to see him at the hospital a couple of times, and finally I just couldn't go back. And that's just what makes the character of Pruitt such a colourful part. He started to cry, and seeing tears coming out of those eyes, I couldn't see anything. His honour before reason stance on not joining the boxing team could come across as ridiculous machismo in the hands of the wrong actor. All I've needed is a top middleweight. I'm sorry, sir, I quit fighting. But his subtlety and sensitivity towards the role turns him into the most compelling character in an already fine ensemble. Great life. I find a pearl, I'll cut you in. 50 50, you know what I mean? Being method, he threw himself into the preparation by taking boxing lessons and learning to play the bugle, even knowing he'd be doubled later. I play the bugle well. He even practiced military drills for hours, and was already exhausted by the time they actually got to filming. Besides your AWOL, they'll throw you in the stockade. They'll be throwing them out of the stockade, any, every guy they can get. Method acting has never really been for me, and I do roll my eyes at some of the lengths it can go to, but there's no denying that with a lot of actors, it really works. <laughs> I gotta turn off the lights, because of the blackout outside. All the effort old Monty put into preparing shows, and it's one of the greatest subtle performances of the Golden Age. You got guts, honey. I hope you can pull it off. His chemistry with every other character is on point, and it kills me that two of my favourites barely interact in one of the best films they ever did. Who is that? She's Captain Holmes' wife. He was convinced he'd win the Oscar for it, and although he was nominated, so was Burt Lancaster, and they sort of cancelled each other out. Otherwise you better know how to soldier. I can soldier with any man. Burt Lancaster's role deserves plenty of praise too, considering playing the all-American good sergeant is undoubtedly more challenging than the troubled orphan who gets abused. I gotta obey my orders, Tom! Okay, I'll see you get a medal. Bust it down, boys! As with Pruitt, Warden refusing to become an officer could have been a silly machismo contrivance to keep him and Karen apart in the hands of the wrong actor. When you get your commission, they ship you back to the States. An officer? Yes. But in the film proper, it's a study of a man who's comfortable where he is, and gives up a chance to be happy out of fears that authority will turn him into someone just as corrupt as the superior he's been undermining. I can't be anything else. If I tried to be an officer, I'd be putting on an act. I just can't do it. Please don't ask me why. He brings a great sensitivity to this character. Was this man a friend of yours? Yes, sir. And you can feel the passion and intimacy in this famous scene. Nobody ever kissed me the way you do. Nobody? No, nobody. Yes, folks, there is far more to it than just the swimsuits. Karen, listen to me, listen. I know. Deborah Carr, of course, doesn't reach the heights she would in The Innocence eight years later, but it's another great performance from her. Because I wanted you to know I'm not as stupid as you maintain all women are. In fact, despite the story being male-centred and the females being there as the love interests, From Here to Eternity is a film that knows how to do that well. I just hate to see a beautiful woman going all to waste. Waste, did you say? There's a subject I might tell you something about. Both women are there to be the partners of Warden and Pruitt, but they have their own lives, backstories and ambitions. And I'm going to go back to my hometown in Oregon and I'm going to build a house for my mother and myself. We actually know more about Karen and Alma's histories than we do about Warden's. I'd only been married to Dana two years when I found out he was cheating. Karen gets to be an extremely rounded character. What are you accusing me of now? Of nothing. It's no longer any of my business how many women you go out with, is it? A sympathetic adulteress with very complex reasons who fights Warden's attempts to slut shame her. And one more thing no more children. Sure, I went out with men after that. And if I'd ever found one that. Karen, listen to me, listen. And even gets to call out her husband on the double standards he benefits from. You can't expect to know how I feel about a thing like this. I wonder why men feel so differently about it than women. It's just not the same. Alma, meanwhile. Okay, her characterization does lose a little something once you know that in the book she was an out-and-out -out prostitute and the Hayes Code had her changed to a nightclub escort, but the statements on class and respectability are still pretty strong. I was a waitress and he was from the richest family in town. He just married a girl suitable for his position. After three years of going around with me. And there's definitely something to the main love interest saying they're not going to get there happily ever after, and they're only together because they need each other at this moment in time. I do mean it when I say I need you. 
because I'm lonely. That makes her second last scene where she offers to marry Prue all the more powerful. We can go back to the States together. We can even get married. Is she just saying whatever she can think of to make him stay? Or has she fallen in love with him for real? If you go now, I'll never see you again, I know it. Donna Reed does some of her finest work. And she was one of the five acting nominees to actually take home Mr. Oscar. The other one was obviously... Oh, there's a cop under there. This was the right kind of role for old Frank to try drama with. Girls. You got any prejudices against girls? Maybe it's not Oscar worthy, but his presence does add quite a bit to the film anyway. Because he's drunk. Why? Do you know why? Because he is. The film is full of solid supporting performances, particularly from Philip Ober and Ernest Borgnine. The latter may have played his part a bit too well, but that's another story. You killed him. Did I? Overall, this film goes hand in hand with All About Eve for me as one where the acting can just really shine. Goodbye, Sergeant. Thanks. Say goodbye. It's... We'll see each other again. And every part, no matter the size of it, sticks in memory. Much as I adore your company, I hope I may be allowed to tear myself away. I just saw a few friends at the door, and I can also see that I will be of no further use to you. And unlike a lot of modern Oscar bait where the story has to take a backseat to the acting, here it enhances it and complements it. After all, you've got a movie that climaxes with Pearl Harbor happening, and you get annoyed at it for interrupting all this high-stakes drama. Kind of the opposite reaction of the 2001 film. I won't come back. You see, my fiancé was killed on December 7th. Oh, I'm sorry. I feel like I could spend hours going on about how great From Here to Eternity is, and not really touch on what makes it so incredible. Okay, fatso. If it's killing you, what? Come on. It's one of the unsung classics that demonstrates the real power of films from the Golden Age. When you watch it, you can see why this period was called that. I think it's the most beautiful place I ever saw in my life. Even though television was on its way and the studio system was about to collapse, From Here to Eternity represents the peak of 1950s cinema. It's the definitive Pearl Harbor story for me, Montgomery Cliff's most iconic performance, a close second or third for Deborah Carr's, and yes, it makes doing it on the sand look <laughs> If I ever get into a discussion about why the Golden Age films have so much appeal to me, From Here to Eternity is going to get brought up very, very quickly. You just couldn't play it smart, could you? All you had to do was box, but no, not you, you hard-hitting. Funny thing is, there ain't gonna be any boxing championships this year.